Well, thanks so much for having us um, here. And um, Kate, it's great to have you here. We're really excited to get um, talking with you. Um, well, Patrick's given you a fantastic introduction, so I won't repeat all that. Um, we are going to have a chat for about 25 minutes. Um, we, there's not going to be time for questions from other people, unfortunately, because we've got so little time. But um, we, I think after that, people are moving into breakout sessions where there's going to be lots of time for interaction. So for now, we just want to hear from you, Kate, really. And I thought, you know, there's so much I'd like to ask you. You know, you're, you're, you're really um, one of the people that's put inequality on the map as an issue. But I thought we'd start with an easy one and just ask, what, what are you working on at the moment? Tell us about what's big for you right now. What's big for me? Well, it's great to be here. Um, Thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, too many things, I'm working on too many things, but basic income is one of them. So I'm part of the group that's going to be evaluating the Welsh government's basic income pilot for young people leaving care. So that's really exciting, really challenging. That's the um, largest financial level of a, of a basic income that's been trialed anywhere in the world. Um, and I guess most people will know about it, but if, if they don't, it's the Welsh government giving £1,600 a month to all young people leaving care for a short period of time and they get it for two years. And we're really interested in the in the broad impact of that, the impact on their health and well-being and on community cohesion, as well as on things like what the, the young people have been able to, to do in terms of entrepreneurship, um, being able to look after themselves, look after those they love, get into training, those choices. I'm also part of a group that's working to make a health case for basic income. You know, I'm, I am a public health academic um, and I think basic income has real potential to help address the deep structural causes of health inequalities and the poor health that we have in this, this country as a whole. So we're trying to build an evidence case for that, work towards pilots, help people understand how you might evaluate this, this kind of process. Um, so that's the basic income work I'm involved in, but too, too many other things going on as well. I'm trying to write another book and I'm just not managing to find a single moment for it. So that one might, yeah. that one might take as long to come out as the, as the gap between the last two. <laughs> yeah, well, there's too much to say, isn't there? But it's interesting. So with pilots, I think a lot of people in these um, uh, in, in these forums are, you know, have a big interest in pilots. But there's often a debate about what, you know, what's the value of pilots? Shouldn't we be pushing forward towards, you know, of implementing this? You know, we know enough now to implement. Like, what do you think the value of pilots is, especially the Welsh one, because that's such an interesting pilot? Well, I was I was really impressed by. I hope it's all right to call you Imi. Anyway, really impressed by what you were saying earlier about the need for, you know, different flavors of things. Let's not all get hung up on, on, you know, making sure that we're just all talking about exactly the same thing. I think the value of pilots is that they can demonstrate that particular flavors of basic income work or don't work for certain groups of people, whether they're feasible to, to put in place, whether we can make the mechanics work. But they're also an opportunity for getting people excited about the phenomenon, whether that's the public citizens or whether it's politicians, policymakers. I think the value of the Welsh government basic, basic income pilot at the moment is it's such a bold piece of social policy. You know, it's it's it took the Welsh government a lot of work to move that through. It showed a real commitment to sort of progressive politics. So that's a sort of flagship thing. And when it, it, it's about the art of the possible, isn't it? When you see that something is possible. I think local pilots can help to excite people about the idea that there might be social policies that could be transforming for their lives, their communities, um, help them feel part of a democratic process if they're choosing for their place to take part in a pilot. So I think, I think there's lots of value to it that's beyond the sort of scientific, social scientific, does basic income work? Does it make people feel better? I think, I think there's real value to them, but that shouldn't stop us campaigning at the same time for this to, to be 
you know, national policy or, or regional policy. So, so lots of value to the pilots, even if each one will just feel like a little thing and that it, that it can't lead to transformational change. It's part of building, building up that picture and getting that movement to change. Yeah, I, I met one of the people who was involved in, in kind of getting the Welsh pilot, um, in, in sort of bringing the idea in the first place. And I, I could be wrong about this, but I seem to remember that what he told me was that the, the idea only came around, I think, during the pandemic. So that would have been 2020. And that the pilot was already in action by like some ridiculously early time, like 2021, 2022, when, when it started, you know, which for me felt like absolute lightning speed in, in policy terms. And, and that in itself felt like an exciting step forward because it's like, you know, we've gone from nothing to, to something actually happening. People, you know, young people actually receiving basic income. Yeah, money you know, in their pockets. Yeah, Money in their pockets, albeit in a trial situation. But that, if this, is, this has gone from nothing to that in, I think, less than two years, which makes you think, you know, we, we can take action on this quickly if we want to. And what it shows, doesn't it, it shows what governments can do when they want to do it. It shows yeah. what they can find funding for and mm -hmm. how swiftly they can act when when they choose to do so. Um, and we I guess we shouldn't be surprised by that. You know, we do see governments making snap decisions about spending large amounts of money, not always in the way <laughs> we want them to, but able to move things along quickly when they choose to. Um, but yes, it's been impressive, I think, to see the Welsh government pushing that. It's been impressive to see the Scottish government having that emphasis on basic income um, really it's really empowering I think to see the devolved government picking up the reins of that policy making and really choosing different sorts of social policies really pushing for a different kind of politics and I think that's so helpful to those of us in England who sort of feel left behind by that to see yeah it is possible and we can we can push push for that sort of change. I can see that um, questions are coming up in the chat about, well, what about other groups? You know, what about mothers and uh, in poverty and that sort of thing? And I suppose, again, maybe that's part of the, the value of pilots um, is they allow you, I suppose, to get deep into understanding the issues for particular groups. I know that at the moment, Nesta are thinking about some kind of cash transfer or basic income for mothers, um, prospective mothers in poverty. And maybe we'll see more things, you know, rolling out uh, for different groups. Um, and I suppose with each one, until you actually get to the universal basic income situation, there will be feasibility issues and particular things that need to be understood if you're doing pilots with different groups. So I hope we will see lots more of them. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to ask about like, one of the um, statistics in the report, uh, in the, the press release of your recent paper about how the health, uh, how, how universal basic income could reduce health costs to the NHS. Um, one of the pieces of um, data quoted in there was that the most ambitious universal basic income um, proposals would reduce inequality by 55%, which obviously is, you know, it's really exciting to read that. Uh, there's one kind of counter argument that I sometimes get asked, which is that if you're raising the amount of money that could reduce inequality by 55 percent when given out universally, obviously that same amount of money could reduce inequality even more if given out in a targeted way. So, you know, you're not giving it to the rich or, the, or people in the sort of upper middle, but you're only giving it to those who really need it. You know. I've always been trying to kind of come up with an elevator pitch sort of answer to why to that of like why is why is universe universality important for in when you're in the fight for in, in tackling inequality like I, I feel like it is I know that it is I have arguments but it's hard to articulate isn't it? <laughs> it is but I, I'll give you two answers and they won't be they won't be the only two yeah what one is to do with the universality of benefits um, and we know from experience that if a if a benefit is not universal then some of the people who you particularly wish to receive that benefit will not get it because they don't apply, they fall through the cracks. Um, that's always been true. And that's always been why progressive policymakers prefer universal um, things when possible. 
because it just helps to ensure that those who need it most do get it. The argument on the, on the other part of your question about why would we do something that gave even small amounts of money to those who don't need it, I think it's to do with the meaning of a universal basic income that isn't about the money, that isn't about the cash. It's, it's about what does it mean to be part of a society that says through a payment it makes, you are all equal. You know, everybody in this society is to be considered equal. They are to be treated the same. I think there's no getting away from the fact that if what we would most likely see are UBI plus schemes coming in where there was a certain level of benefit and then a recognition that if other people have particular needs, they will need to get extra. Um, but I do think there's something powerful psychologically about this, this notion that your society is investing in all of us. Society values all of us. Society wants to treat all of us equally. I think there's a meaning there that is probably worth more um, than anything you can put a pound sign on. Yeah. Yeah, I've sometimes likened it to like the National Health Service because like, you know, people don't, there's no debate about, oh, why do rich people get to use the National Health Service? They could pay for private. You know, it's completely understood as just, of course, everybody needs healthcare. And in the same way, of course, everybody needs a basic level of income. Um, yeah. But it's yeah. funny, you know, with the National Health Service, that argument's been won, you know, 75 years ago. No one's questioning that anymore. So, you know, it does make you think, where could we be? You know, where could we be in this conversation in 75 years? You know, or even five I think, or ten be, years I think it'll be sooner those. than seventy-five. I hope it'll be sooner than seventy-five. But <laughs> yeah. I think yes, it will be. Um, that will be the sorts of conversations we're having. You know, well, why wasn't it obvious to us so much earlier that this is the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the kind of level of change that um, that you work on, and because you, the the kind of work you focused on has tended to be very much at the national level. Um, now, my work is at the global level. We look at global inequality and we've explored global basic income as a solution to that. Um, and a lot of people here in the Basic Income North um, conference are working on like the kind of regional city, city region um, level. Yeah. And so I wondered if you felt that that your conclusions and your research um, had had lessons for, for both the global and the local level, as well as the national. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, I, I think that the finding, the sort of the kernel of, of our research, the research I do with, with Richard Wilkinson, is that um, inequality, the gap between rich and poor, affects all of us and it affects a wide range of issues. It affects health, population health, but it affects social cohesion. It affects human capital development, which is a horrible word for how kids do in school and, and their lifetime chances. Um, this does appear to be a universal sort of finding in that it applies just as much in um, all parts of the world as it does in rich developed countries. Um, the difference is that in some societies, there's still a need for some um, growth in traditional terms. There's still a need for some sort of economic growth development as well as driving towards inequality reduction. Whereas in rich countries, we've really sort of come to the end of any, any of that. And we should be really solely focused on inequality reduction and reducing the harm caused by inequality. Um, but the inequality lesson, if you will, the, the meaning of that, that's universal, that's worldwide. Um, it applies just as much in the majority world as here. So, I think there's a need to be campaigning at international level, as well as national and as well as local. Um, I'm part of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, which is trying to foster transformation towards wellbeing economy focus across the world, um, as well as trying to shift things around national politics and policymaking here in the UK. But then also, you know, I'm, I do do work locally as well. Um, I was honoured and 
privilege to be asked to chair the Greater Manchester Independent Inequalities Commission, which was all about what could be done in the city region to help reduce inequalities there. And I do a lot of work in Bradford, a lot of work um, in other local areas. And at the moment, starting to work with a new body called Health Equity North, which is really taking sort of pan-Northern approach to, to thinking about health inequalities. So it's, it's horses for courses a lot of the time. It's thinking about um, where is there room for campaigning activism, possibilities for transformational change now? Where are we going to have to build it more gradually? Um, what are the right angles to take? Who are the right people to network with and create alliances with to sort of achieve the change we want in all of those places? Mm. Yeah. And... I was reading a um a blog that you wrote I think it was towards the end of last year and you were saying that when you first published the spirit level you um you, there was a really good response and you know it it you know and I, I certainly feel and a lot of people here I think feel that you know it really did bring inequality into the picture in a way where you, with it, which really separated it from poverty as an issue and made it kind of an issue in its own right and at first you felt that, that got a good response and um, and people in, in kind of political positions were paying attention, but you were expressing your frustration that kind of more, more than 10 years later, there hadn't been the progress. And in fact, they've been kind of backsliding on a lot of it and, and inequality is getting worse in a lot of cases. Um, I wondered if you had any, you know, you've, you've been working on these issues for a long time and, and maintaining that dedication and focus and you set up the Equality Trust, which is, which is working on that too. Um, I wondered if you had any kind of, words of wisdom, I guess, for, for the activists here, including me, that sometimes struggle to keep the faith, I guess. It, it can be hard when it feels like we're making no progress. It can be hard. Um, although 10 years, you know, might feel like a long time, but actually to create transformational social change, that's not a huge amount of time. Yeah. I think we have seen a real shift in the degree to which people policymakers and politicians included, but also citizens recognize and accept the damage caused by inequality. And that has been a change. I like to think, you know, that we were, were part of that and helped to, you know, create that, that shift. Certainly I know that before the spirit level, we were told that within new labor, there could be no discussion of inequality. You could talk about poverty, but not about inequality. That's not true anymore. Everybody does talk about inequality and I think does recognize the damage. And that's a necessary first step, isn't it? Towards change. So I suppose the fact that there's been some shift means it's worth keeping on with things. Um, you never know when the moment's going to come either. You never know when there might be a tipping point. Um, a, a time when a, just a little bit of leverage might cause cause a lot of change. Who would have thought that a single Swedish schoolgirl deciding to protest against the climate emergency could have such a big impact? You never know when when the opportunities are going to be there. And I think the other thing that keeps me going really is um, the passion that young people often bring to, to these issues, um, their willingness to fight for change, their, their commitment to these causes. So I don't feel it's hopeless. I do feel it's slow and I mm -hmm. wish it were, I wish change came, came more rapidly, but I think, I think there is change afoot. I think we will see some, some big changes politically next year Possibly even tomorrow. I voted this morning. I live in Selby and Ainsty um, constituency, so I was at the polling booth this morning. There's possible there'll be some some upheaval um, in the next twelve months that takes us in unforeseen directions. So we just keep we just keep hoping, I think, and just keep working away with it. And the other thing I think that surprises me is how short memories can be in the media or in the policy making arena, you sometimes feel as an academic, well, you know, well, I've shown that, and produced that evidence. Um, why isn't anybody acting on it? And then you find out nobody remembered it really. And you do have to keep telling people the same things. You do have to keep things fresh. You do have to keep 
bringing things to people's attention, reminding them. So lots to do. Yeah, it does keep me getting up every morning. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. And I think, like you say, there's there's a lot of room for hope, isn't there? Like I think you know, Emmy said at the end of her um, session that you know, when when there's a crisis, when the crisis really bites, people reach for the ideas that are lying around. You know, that's a it's a famous phrase, but it's really important. And I think there's actually been a lot of building over the last sort of 30 years, I think, in, in building like a kind of new version of the left and, and recreating what it means to be left wing after sort of the fall of the old left and Soviet Union and, and all of that. It's like we've had to reinvent this um, and bring in climate change and, and the ecological crisis as well um, and, and bring in a lot of other factors that perhaps weren't considered by the old, le old left. And we're inventing a lot of new thought. And I think I think that's going to bear fruit at some point. But yeah, it's um it's good to hear those. It's, 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 we, we need to keep keep the hope between ourselves because um. There's yeah. still a lot to do. I heard I heard those last words of him. I thought those were really wise words, actually, that we have to be anticipating those those moments. We have to be ready um, for when those times come. Um, and so an afternoon like this is part of that. Um, and it is it is it is to do with alliance building. It is to do with us all being ready to use our particular strengths or our particular pieces of evidence or our particular campaigning skills to make sure that that we push for as much change as we can mm -hmm. yeah brilliant well thanks so much Kate I think we're running out of time so I'm going to have to um leave it there but we're really grateful for you joining the conference today and um and yeah for your work in Greater Manchester where I am and uh and I think uh lots of us were going to be today and um yeah, thanks for being involved and thanks for everything. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hand you all back to Patrick to go into the breakouts now. Thanks a lot. Great to talk to you, Laura.